Evening, every woo, evening, everybody. Hello, hello, and welcome. So, uh, I've got uh, one quick announcement before we get started. First, I want to say thank you for coming out. Uh, this is a really, this is going to be a really cool night. I'm excited, really excited about it. We do have child care. I don't see a lot of, I don't see my kids running around, so I'm assuming they're back there. But that's in the red room. If you do need that, just in case anybody needs to know that. Um, before we sing, so we're going to kick off with a song. And it's really fitting, especially after this morning's service, that we're coming together today on a special occasion. But in all things, we want to give glory to the Lord. So we want to celebrate tonight. Um, we want to have fun. We want to encourage one another. But what a, what a better way just to start with song. Um, and so I'm going to pray for us. I want to say thank you for coming it means a lot. We're really glad that you're here as a body of, of believers. We can come together to support one another. So I'm going to pray, and uh, and then Patricia's going to lead us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this church. I thank you that you have allowed us um, to be a congregation right here in Magnolia. And I thank you um, for the, 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 the people that you have brought here. I thank you for the mighty ways that you have moved. Um, and I thank you that we get to celebrate the installation of, of elders this morning or this evening. And so I ask that as we go through tonight, God, that we are encouraged, um, that our faith is strengthened, that you are glorified, that your name is magnified, um, that we can, we can sing out to you as our mighty God. And so we submit to you, we turn the night over to you, and, um, and we are grateful that you are Lord. Um, we are grateful that you are good, and we are grateful for the opportunities that you have given us to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, good evening to all of you again. I'm going to have you guys stand if you can. And we're going to start out with a very old hymn um, that's appropriate, like Alan was saying, for tonight. It's called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Um, it's very easy to follow if you haven't heard it. But if you have, y'all just sing loud um, and please sing with me, um, as I always encourage you to do. Thus 
Spirit, and the gifts are ours through Him who with us abided. The goods and kindred go. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good evening. It's good to see you guys. I want to have you open your Bible, if you would, to 2 Timothy 4. Uh, tonight is a bit different uh, as far as preaching goes. And uh, my intent tonight is to uh, preach to an audience of two, for the most part. I am talking to Steve and James tonight. Um, but I'm also encouraging our hearts and our minds as we do this. And so, um, Steve, James, I am grateful to the Lord for you guys. Uh, I am grateful for his sending you to us and for calling you to serve New Life Community Church as pastors. And I'm thrilled, thrilled to see uh, these pastors that are here with us and this congregation affirm and approve your calling tonight. And so it is with great joy that I stand before all of you tonight and deliver this pastoral charge to these two men. May God grant all of us a deeper understanding and appreciation for pastoral ministry uh, through this message, through this time that we have tonight. And for this charge, I want us to go to the Apostles, the Apostle Paul's charge to Timothy. Timothy was his son in the faith. We meet Timothy on Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, Timothy leaves goods and kindred uh, to follow the work of the ministry that the Lord has called him to, to work uh, as a son in the faith to Paul, to be his protege in ministry. Here in 2 Timothy, Paul is at the end of his life. Um, he has taught Timothy so many things, and he has left Timothy in Ephesus to pastor the people there, and he writes these words as an encouragement to him. Uh, these are his you know, he wants Timothy to come to him, but these are his final written words to Timothy, um, who is a young pastor here. And so these eight verses at the end of 2 Timothy 4 are thick, to say the least. Uh, there is plenty of gospel encouragements and exhortations here uh, for pastoral ministry, and we could spend a long time looking into these, and I don't intend to do that tonight, uh, but I want to share some things, at least three things with you tonight that I think Paul lays out here for the pastor's ministry. And so if you would, would you stand with me tonight as we read 2 Timothy 4? I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist to fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let me pray for us now. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We ask now that you would encourage us, strengthen us, deepen our faith. But Lord, now we pray for Steve and for James. Lord, as you uh, have called them to pastoral ministry, we pray, Lord, that this charge will be a mark, a monument of their journey of faith, a moment in their life uh, where you solidified for them, Lord, the call that they've received from you. I pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified tonight. It's in the name of Christ I pray. We thank you, Lord, again for this moment we have. Amen. I'm sorry. I gave Patricia the wrong instructions. So, thank you, Pat. The first thing we see here about the pastor's ministry is that he is to preach the word. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. What I want us to first see here is the severity of Paul's address. I charge you, he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. The work of a minister is not indifferent, brothers. The work of the minister is of grave, grave importance. By the proclamation of the word, dead souls come to life. Alive souls receive instruction for godly living and are preserved on their journey to heaven's glories. Therefore, woe to you, brothers, if you do not preach the gospel. And woe to us, church, if we do not put men in the office of elder who mis or if we do put men in the office of elder who mishandle God's word. We must not do so. These things are not indifferent. These are not figureheads that we're asking for tonight or that we're calling tonight. These are not men who sit on a board. These are men who charged with the task of caring for our souls in the stead of Christ himself. And so the eye of God and of Jesus Christ is upon his ministers. He is watching us. And for this reason, we must only engage in the kind of work that God approves, which is first and foremost, word-centered work. Why must we be so careful? Well, Paul lays it out here for us. He says, because we work for the Lord, right? He's saying it's in his view. It's in view of God and in view of Christ himself. And so if we're working for the Lord, then it is his work, not our work that we do. Amen? If we're working for the Lord, we understand that he is the Lord and we are simply his ministers. He is the king and we are his heralds. He is the great shepherd and we are his under shepherds. This task is too great for us. It's too large for us to fulfill in our own giftings or in our own abilities. We need Christ. And so this is one reason for Paul's appealing to the sight of God and to Jesus Christ for doing only that which God approves. Another reason that he does so is he says just very plainly, in fact, he bookends the charge with this idea or this truth of the appearing of Christ, that he will appear, as we see in 4.1, and, uh, and then in verse 8, we see that he will appear there as well. And so it's bookended with the appearings of Christ, and this is what Paul means for Timothy to understand is that Christ Jesus will return. Christ Jesus is building his kingdom. He's fixing, as is all things in Christianity, he's fixing everything about the weight of pastoral ministry on the return of Christ. That it's his kingdom you're working for. It's his kingdom you're building. And if we try to build our own kingdom, we will not love the appearing of Christ. We will hate it. We will loathe it. But nonetheless, we will bow in submission to the rightful king. But if we will, if we will build the kingdom of Christ, if we will promote his kingdom by preaching his word, 
we will love the appearing of Christ. And this is the things that he lays out. This is what we understand about the return of Christ. Paul wants Timothy to understand that it is soon to come. And by eternity standards, it is soon. <laughs> Amen? Even if it's another 2,000 years, it is soon. Christ will return. He will judge all by the appointment of God the Father that he's received. Judgment is his. He came once as a suffering servant. He rose as a victorious king, and he will return as the judge. Amen? We will not escape it. He will appear in a glorious appearing. It's amazing here. What he's saying is, is that he will be deity in sight. He will be the very Son of God, God himself, the second member of the Trinity, and we will see him. And thirdly, he says his kingdom. Let's do this because of his kingdom, right? I charge you by his kingdom, which means that his kingdom is coming. His kingdom will be seen. We read at the end of Revelation that there's a throng of worshipers to come from every tribe and tongue and nation, and that it is a multitude that is too numerous to count. You see, Christ is victorious. There, there, just as we sang a moment ago, there is nothing and no one and no power and no evil that will stop his coming, that will stop him from building his kingdom. And he does it by the proclamation of his word. He uses his servants for this. He doesn't only use ministers. He equips, he uses ministers to equip the members for the work of the ministry, as we see in Ephesians 4. And so that's our job. That's your task. In light of these truths, Paul charges Timothy to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. When you're preaching the word, what you're doing is you're announcing to all the message of the king. You're announcing to all the coming kingdom of the king. It says, Christ preached at the beginning of his ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we now say, repent and believe in Christ for his kingdom is at hand. Amen. We must herald the gospel message. We are but heralds of the message, whether inside this congregation or outside of it, whether we're preaching here, teaching here, teaching in Sunday school, teaching in a home group, or just talking with a neighbor. We are now heralds of the gospel. And so when should you herald the gospel of Christ? Always. <laughs> Always. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, stand at the ready. Be on guard, if you will, so that whether the time is convenient or inconvenient, whether you feel like it or you do not, you are ready to deliver the message of Christ. And what is the content and the work of the message? Reproves your hearers. It's a tough word today, right? To be a reproving preacher. One who exposes false teachings, false beliefs. One who exposes sins. But this is what we are to do. We are to prove by the scriptures that man is guilty of sin. We're to prove by the scriptures that false teachers are guilty of falsities. Your job, brothers, is to preach the word in such a way that you are shining a bright light that exposes false beliefs and sins so that your hearers may turn finally to Christ for salvation. Reprove your hearers. Secondly, he says to rebuke your hearers. At first glance, this seems very similar to reproving, yet it is different. Here we warn forcefully. It's an imploring of a different nature. Reproving is simply just showing the falsities. Rebuking is saying you must turn from these falsities. You must repent. As Christ would often tell those whom he helped, go and sin no more. Once someone sees the light, they are to be encouraged to go and sin no more. Amen. And then finally he says exhort. We are to exhort our hearers is added to rebuke, right? It is to urge people to respond in faith, to urge them to faith-filled action, to urge them not to sit still in their false beliefs, 
not to look as one looks into the mirror and sees the issues of his face and then just walks away as though he's seen nothing, right? It's to urge them to fix your face, right? Turn from sin. Walk according to the word of God. Walk according to the truth. Turn from worldly wise man and walk according to godly wisdom. Amen? And how should you do it? I love this because, again, with the words you're seeing, there's a knee-jerk reaction here that if preachers are reproving and rebuking and exhorting, that they're not going to be gentle, that they're going to be forceful, and they're going to be rude and possibly arrogant, and such preachers exist. But I'm confident that these two men are not going to be these kinds of pastors. And so Paul says to do it with complete patience and teaching. Complete patience and teaching. You reprove, you rebuke, you exhort with complete patience and teaching. Complete patience comes from bearing many hardships. It's an endurance of pain or unhappiness. It's the idea of being steadfast, immovable. If you want to be the kind of minister of the gospel that is approved by God, then you must exercise complete patience. Trust God always. Understand that both good and evil have their purpose with God. Every moment belongs to him. It is his and it is from his hand. And so you bear hardships by looking to the one who endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, which was a people for himself, a covenant people. Whatever hardship and trial you face in ministry, remember it is temporary. It's temporary. It will not undo you if you trust in the Lord. God will sustain his ministers as they look to him for their steadfastness. And so you must be patient and you must teach. Teaching is of all, teaching is all those activities of educating or instructing. It is both proclamation and demonstration. Amen. It's walking side by side with those who need to be taught, but it's also saying the right things as well, to teach right doctrine, sound doctrine, to refute unsound doctrine and uh, cunning practices and ways. We look for those things and we rebuke those, but ultimately our goal is to teach the members of the body of Christ. Amen to follow him, to understand their calling, and to do it faithfully. Do it faithfully, right? Teach with all patience. And so I charge you, brothers, to preach the word in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, to do it faithfully because God the Father and Jesus Christ are watching us. You're always in their presence. You're never not near them, and they're never not near you. And so as fearful as it is to think that God is always near me, it's always highly encouraging to us. It protects us. It guards us from sinfulness. It keeps us in faithful ministry to know that he is near to us. And do it as one who knows that he will, he will return. He will return. Hebrews 13 teaches us that we will give an account to God for those whom we pastor, whom we lead. And so we do this with sobriety. Amen? Sober mind. The second thing we see here is fulfill your ministry. Look at 3 through 5 here. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I love this. This is a series here of negative and positive statements. Sometimes we learn what to do by seeing what not to do. Amen? truths are reinforced by showing the negatives at times, right? So we have here a series of negative statements and positive statements. I'll point them out to you. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. 
as for you, always endure. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers. As for you, do the work of an evangelist. They will do this to suit their own passions. As for you, be sober-minded. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, fulfill your ministry. Brothers, the reason this has taken a year and a half to get to this place is because we have no desire to set you up for failure. We want you to feel equipped and to know that the Lord is with you. We want you to be able to fulfill your ministry. Amen. And so it takes some time to do that, to prepare for that, probably longer than you've been given, to be honest. But I praise God for you. In a world where pastors are dropping like flies, in a world where pastors are self-seeking and getting caught up in the rat race of pragmatism, in a world where pastors are more concerned about building platforms and ministries on social media than they are the people in their congregation, I praise God for you two and for these two. Because that's not your desire. It's clear. You want to serve the people of this body. And we see it clearly. Amen? We affirm this tonight. We're grateful to have you with us. And I believe that you will fulfill your ministry. Will it be perfect always? No. Neither was Paul's or Timothy's. But I believe that the Lord will sustain you. The world's going to always have its sinful passions and pursuits. But as for you, always, each time, (laughs) be someone who can be counted on. Be steady, always ready. Men, be sober-minded, he says. And again, in a world where people are forsaking commitments all the time, whether it's their marriages, whether it's their commitment to their local church, whether it's their job, whatever it may be, people are forsaking commitments. I don't mean just, you know, a Netflix commitment. I mean real, meaningful things. As they give in to worldly passions, we must be the kind of men who are sober-minded, who are not drawn into the things of the world. We must be the kind of men who keep our wits about us, if you will. In a world uh, where there is a complete lack of self-control, we must be self-controlled, be sober-minded. We must curb the controlling influence of disorderly emotions or desires. Endure suffering, similar to complete patience. I'll grant you that. We must be willing to suffer misfortune for the sake of the high calling as God's ministers, which means we bear hardships patiently. Ministry will be difficult. It will be. Whether you're serving in an elder role, pastoral role, or you are ministering to children, or you are working in the sound booth, or you are ministering in some other way, ministry is difficult. Amen? And so he says, do the work of an evangelist. Again, in a world where people are forsaking things and turning to worldly passions, worldly pursuits, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Carry out the duty of boldly proclaiming the gospel to all. The gospel here is the totality, as we mentioned earlier this morning. It's the totality of Christ's ministry. It's his past work on the cross, his present work now in heaven for his people, and his future work when he returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth and he judges all. Preach Christ. Know nothing, as Paul says, except Christ and him crucified. Fulfill your ministry. Paul is telling Timothy here, fully accomplish your God-given assignment of service to others on behalf of God. That's what ministry is. It's service to God's people on behalf of the Lord himself. 
He says, fulfill your ministry. It's the idea of if I had a glass up here that I were to, to fill it up. It's to fill the glass full. <laughs> Listen, brothers, as others turn away from the gospel, as others seek new teachers with itching ears, as others look for a message that fits their desires, you must always be sober-minded. You must always endure suffering. You must always do the work of an evangelist so that you will fulfill your ministry. Stand on the word of God. Finally, Paul encourages Timothy to pursue the crown of righteousness. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, he says here in verse 6, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Here Paul stands with a fulfilled ministry. I am being poured out. He tells Timothy, fill your cup. Paul's saying, my cup is full. I've reached the end. I'm being poured out now as a drink offering to the Lord. All of it, all that I've done, filling this cup belongs to who? The Lord. It's his. I am but a drink offering for him. There is no personal glory in pastoral ministry. There's no room for it. You live for the glory of another. You proclaim the glory of another. You fight for the glory of another. You have faith in the glory of another. Amen? You're seeking a different homeland. You're not looking to build a kingdom here. You know the kingdom you're headed for and you're marching forward. Amen? That's what we're going to do. And so he's fulfilled it. He's saying, I'm ready to be poured out now. I'm ready to depart this life, to be joined to Christ in heaven. As I was looking at this, I was reminded of Paul writing to the Philippians. And he says in chapter 1, verse 20, he said, it is my eager expectation. He's in jail. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. This is what he says. It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Amen. And so here he's, he got to escape there. <laughs> but here he's writing to Timothy saying, I have fought the fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And how did he do it? We well, did it in the same ways that he lays out for Timothy in these verses. It was a life committed to preaching the gospel of Christ. It was a life committed to being ready in season and out of season. It was a, a life committed to reproving and rebuking and exhorting with all patience and teaching God's people. It was a life committed to being always sober-minded, enduring suffering, evangelizing all people. And so that he might at the end of his race say, I'm being poured out. It's full. Brother, these are our goals as pastors. In the 1700s, there was a missionary. I'm not even going to try to read his name. but And he shared his intentions for his life this way. So this is the goal of his life. If he could sum it up in one sentence, this is what he says my purpose is. To preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. And I love it. I, I agree that that is a worthy endeavor. And I want you to never forget that you are working for an eternal crown. For a crown that is laid up for you in heaven, as Peter says in 1 Peter 5. And so Paul finishes his race by losing his head for the sake of Christ. Charles Spurgeon wrote this about this passage. He says, see he springs, talking about Paul, he springs from his dungeon 
to his throne. Nero may cut off his head, but that head shall wear a starry crown. Courage, then, you who are downtrodden, afflicted, and despairing. Be of good cheer, for the end will make up for the way, and all the roughness of the pilgrimage will be well recompensed by the glory that shall await all those who are resting upon Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Timothy stayed in Ephesus. He preached the word. He did the work of an evangelist. He refuted false gods. In fact, there was a time where there was a festival taking place in Ephesus. It was a festival to a false god, and the name false gods are being worshipped at the festival. There's two different accounts of how what all was taking place, but the point of the story is the same, that there was a festival unto false gods taking place. And Timothy, rather than sitting at home, twiddling his thumbs, wondering, you know, lamenting over the fact that people are worshiping false gods, he goes and he preaches and he proclaims and he does the work of an evangelist. And do you know the people didn't fall on their knees in worship of God? They picked up clubs and they beat him. They beat him to a pulp. And he died a few days later, wounded for the name of Christ. What a worthy, worthy death. What a worthy calling. So many of us are unfit for such a high calling to give our life for Christ. Revelation tells us that there is a special place reserved under the throne for martyrs. So not many of us will be called to that, but the point remains, in season, out of season, always be ready to preach the word. You may or may not get remembered. You're certainly not going to be written in Scripture. <laughs> there may be a biography about you one day. There may not. But that's not the point, is it? The point here is that you are living and working unto the Lord for an eternal crown of glory kept in heaven for you. It's to be received at the appearing of Christ, whether you go to him or he comes to us. And in so doing, you can guarantee that you will impact future generations because he is committed to building his kingdom by the proclamation of his word. Whether we're singing it, whether we're reading it, whether we're preaching and teaching it, he's committed to this. And so he establishes pastors as a gift to local churches to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And we're grateful, grateful to receive you as such tonight. Build your life and your ministry on that, that future crown. And you may rest assured that Christ and his eternal kingdom will be yours. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Again, I praise you for these brothers. I thank you for this time we have together, and I thank you for what we're about to do. Lord, you have been too kind to us. You have been more gracious than we deserve. You have given us godly men all across this church, and you have seen fit to call two for now to pastoral ministry, and so we praise you for this, Lord. I thank you for this word, and I ask, Lord, that you would help the elders of this church always, both now and in the future, be committed to the words of this charge from Paul to Timothy, to be faithful to it, to abide by it, to live it, and to die with it as our great hope, that there is for us a crown of righteousness, but not only for us, for all who love your appearing, as Paul says. And so we preach and we proclaim in such a way that many will love the appearing of Christ. Would you help us to be fruitful to that end? We plant, we water, you give the increase. And so we commit our work to you, Father. 
We thank you for your son Christ who has saved us by his own death and his resurrection. That he sits now on the throne in heaven exercising dominion over all things and he will return. And we praise you for your spirit who gives us life, who invigorates us, who beautifies everything about life and in life. He helps us become more like Christ. He transforms us as we behold Christ into the same image of Christ. And so we love your spirit. We are grateful to you, Father, for your work. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together tonight. Take my life and let it be. seated. James and Steve, will you join me on stage and stand here to my right? At this time, I'm going to ask them a series of questions about their commitments, and I want these to be public so that you understand what they're committing themselves to as pastors of New Life Community Church. Brothers, welcome. Do you earnestly commit to uphold the character qualifications for the office of elder found in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Will you earnestly commit to preach the full counsel of the Word of God in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching? Will you earnestly commit to always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, doing the work of an evangelist, Will you fulfill your ministry? Will you earnestly commit to fight the good fight, to run the race with endurance, 
keep the faith to pursue the crown of righteousness that Christ gives above all other earthly crowns. Do you earnestly commit to glorify God by loving, leading, serving, and equipping the members of New Life Community Church to grow in their faith in Jesus and their love for one another? Will you abide by the New Life Community Church statement of faith in your ministry? Will you abide by the Danvers Statement on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, the Nashville Statement, uh, Coalition for Biblical Sexuality, and the Dallas Statement on Social Justice and the Gospel in your ministry? Amen. Amen. Alan, would you come? And Jasper, would you come? Act like I've never used a mic before. Um, I'm really glad we're doing this. And so I'll keep this brief. We have not always done it this way. Um, and what I love about our church and what I'm, I'm very grateful and proud to be a part of this team is that uh, the more that we get in the Word, the more we are trying to strive to be as biblical as we can. And so I want to share a, a couple things here. And I'm talking to y'all, I'm talking to them. It's not. You did well. You did really well. Uh, so we see a story in Acts here where in chapter 6, there were an increasing amount of demands that... Uh, they were having a hard time keeping up with. And so in chapter 6, we see this, and it, it says there was an increasing number of complaint by the Hellenists, which is just another way of saying Greek-speaking Jews. And they're like, we need more people to proclaim this so that we can continue to preach. And so it goes down, and they, they, they've prayed, they've picked some guys, and it says, these they set before the apostles, um, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. So in just a second, we're going to pray for you, and we're going to lay our hands on you. But I'm telling you this to, to get a little of the backstory of why we're doing this. So there, there's no place in the Bible that we see a specific service like what we're doing. But what we do see time and time again is when Paul sends Timothy, for instance, to, to Crete, and he says, go establish elders in every town, every place, so we see this establishment each and every time. And we're not given a specific way to do it. And so as our church has hopefully grown, as, as we are maturing in Christ, and we see these little glimpses of what the early church done, we're simply trying to do our best to follow this as best as we can. And we see that through baptism. We see that through communion, the different conversations that we've had. And I'm so proud that we get to have those with y'all. Um, I, I can't, I can't tell y'all the amount of respect I have for you two men just to get to be around you. And so we see that in, in, in chapter six of Acts, and we know that Paul has done this with Timothy. And then it goes on and in first Timothy, uh, at the end of chapter five, he has been instructing, um, Paul has been instructing Timothy and he has been telling him these and for Mike, that I'm so sorry. Paul Bear? That's good, yeah. He's the power of his name. Of what's duty. And so he said this. Verse 17, chapter 5. He goes on and he said, Let the elders rule well, be considered worthy of no walk, especially those who later in preaching and teaching. For the church was starting to show not puddle with ox and church up and drink. And the labor deserved to play. We go to all the church in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ and of the away thing. I charge you, we eat the evil without preaching. And then here's the part he says, and he's, he's telling Timothy, as he's establishing these elders everywhere, this is, this is what you're to do. He says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands 
nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. And then he goes on and he makes these things that it takes a long time to see the character. This is, this is something that we don't want to take lightly is what I'm getting at. The, and the Bible tends to lay, or continues to lay that out. So we're just getting started, man. And it's an honor. And uh, so if, if we will, we'll just join around and we're going to pray for them. We're going to lay our hands on them. That's what the Bible seems to lay out. Um, and we're going to commission you fellas um, to join as the elder team right here. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here. I'm not hopping up there. Um but will you join us in prayer, please? Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for sending James and Steve to us. We thank you um, for establishing this church. We thank you for your word. God, and we thank you for your instruction. And so, Lord, we pray that as, as these men are commissioned here, we affirm them, and we know that you have put them here to serve. Lord, not just to serve on some type of board, not just to serve in some kind of uh, official capacity, Lord, um, to serve you. God, and we are much better of a church with these men. We are much stronger as a church with these men. Not because of power within them, Lord. Because of your Holy Spirit. And God, we know that we don't always get it right. We are not trying to um, persuade anybody that we do. We surrender and we submit to you. We want to run um, any kind of uh, a wise counsel that we think we may have through your scripture, God, and your word makes it clear um, that a plurality brings forth wisdom. God, and so I thank you. I thank you for Kyle, for Jasper, for Steve, James. God, I thank you that you allow me to be a part of this leadership. And Lord, we pray that as we move forth, that you help us seek you out in all instances, in all circumstances. God, I pray for James and Steve, that whatever the days lie ahead, Lord, that, that what Kyle just read be reminded to them daily. God, help them fulfill the ministry. Help us all fulfill our ministry here. For we lean on you, not on our own understanding, not on our own strength, not on our own wisdom, not on the things that we may think. We lean on your word because we know that you will not fail. We know that you will uphold us. This is not a hope that we just hope uh, haphazardly. This is something we can hope for with a surety because you are God we boast not in ourselves but only in you Lord we are grateful for these two men we welcome them with open arms here in Jesus Christ's name amen guys thank y'all so much it's you ma'am that right oh yeah it's her I'm not good at this. If y'all please stand with us. I feel like a music director walking forward doing that. Um, we're going to sing. All right. For our last song of the evening, we're going to do one that's a very familiar hymn for all of you. It's How Great Thou Art. And we're going to end this because we're going to sing uh, about just how wonderful God is. Amen. Um, what a blessed night this has been. Um, and God is working here. Um, he has sent us sent us two new elders that we are just so thankful and blessed by. Um, so so we're, we're going to sing loud. I ask that you do sing loud and let's just praise his name. Oh Lord my God when I in awesome wonder consider all the 
I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. That God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. With shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Okay, well, we are done with tonight's service. Uh, as we conclude, I want to again congratulate you guys and thank you for all your hard work over the last year and a half throughout this process, for your dedication to this church, these people. Um, I think I can speak for everybody here when we say, proud to have you. So <clears throat> at this time, uh, we would like to present you both with your certificate of license and a gift from your church family. Here we bring those up. You guys, if y'all don't mind, come on up here. Here. We have James Jones's certificate of ministry. We would like to present that to you, sir, and thank you very much. And here's a small gift from the church. We would not send a soldier into battle without a rifle and we got you a trusty sword all right steve the same for you steve's certificate here shake your hand sir thank you so much here's your bible thank you thank you both i love you guys and um now we are going to dismiss and go have a great party to honor these guys so um we're going to go back to the life center um i'm going to pray for us to bless the food Normally, we have tables down the hall, but this time, it's all in the Life Center in the middle of the room. Uh, you can mix and mingle, hug these guys, congratulate them, and we're going to go hang out and have a good time, all right? So join me in prayer, and we'll bless the food and be dismissed.
Father, we love you so much. God, we are so thankful for these two men that you have sent to us. We're thankful for their hard work, for their perseverance, their dedication to this church, and mostly to you and to the gospel. God, I just pray that as we go forward from this day on, that you do all the things that Kyle has talked about tonight, that you equip us to do this work you've given us, that you give us strength and courage, that you give us steadfastness and boldness. God, we just pray that you pour out your spirit on these two men as they take on this ministry and help come alongside this church to proclaim the gospel in this area. God, we love them, and we're so thankful for them. We're thankful to be a part of their lives and to have them at this church. We thank you for sending them to us. We just pray that we can surround them with love and support tonight. We do all of this, not for them, not for their honor and glory, but for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.